Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today I'll be discussing the recent opinion that was released by Justice Samuel Alito in the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health case. Completely out of the blue, completely unprecedented. We'll be talking a lot about precedent. This is the first time I've ever heard of of an opinion being released before publication. This was published on Monday, May 2nd on Politico. Uh, Since then, Justice John Roberts, the chief of the Supreme Court, has come out to say, yes, this was leaked. Yes, this is not a fraud, and the court will be looking into it to to see why it was leaked and breach of Supreme Court protocol. So we do know that the opinion is not a fraudulent one. This is, in fact, a draft prepared by Justice Alito. Today I'll be talking about what Alito actually describes. We'll go through the case And for those who missed it, we had an interview recently on the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health case with Alexia Korberg, who's one of the lawyers representing Jackson Women's Health. Uh, And I recommend that you check that out and listen to what they have to say on the case. But today, I'm not going to be going through with a political agenda if something sneaks through that gives you a clue on where I stand on this issue. That's not the intention. It may just be the time of day. But what I will be explaining is Alito's arguments. What did Justice Alito use as justification to overturn, not to carve back, to overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey? And I'll go through in somewhat of a methodical way. I'm going to try and cover this in half an hour, even though it's about a 100-page opinion. I did just read it, so it's pretty fresh. So to kick things off, Alito starts with basically dividing the world into three groups. One, those that believe that life begins in conception. Two, those that believe that the right to an abortion is a fundamental right. And a third group that views abortion as acceptable under certain circumstances. And Alito goes on to say that, well, It's not the court's role, perhaps, to determine which of those three is correct, and he'll get to that a bit more later. Maybe now's the time to quickly remind you of the Mississippi law at issue here, Dobbs v. Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi. Here we're talking about the Gestational Age Act, which sets the legal limit for abortion at I believe 15 weeks. You cannot get an abortion after 15 weeks, according to this Mississippi law. And we'll get into it a little bit more, but this violated core abortion rights. Roe v. Wade established that up until the end of the second trimester, states can basically not interfere with women's right to choose. 15 weeks is pre-viability. So under Roe, And under Casey and under the abortion regime that's been in place since Casey uh, over 30 years ago, this law would have been seen as unconstitutional. And that's what the lower courts found. Here, Alito says the decision was binary. You told us it was binary. It can't be both ways. They're not going to find that Roe and Casey are correct and somehow Mississippi is still correct in some way. And by the way, we're going with Mississippi. So right at the top, Alito makes clear that not only is the court going to uphold the law in Mississippi, but he goes right in to undermine the arguments in in Casey and in Roe, particularly that the 14th Amendment right to liberty created this uh, fundamental right to abortion. We'll talk about this more Alito spends, I'm going to estimate, you know, 30% of this 98-page opinion talking about history. He spends plenty of time arguing that not only was this right to abortion not found at the time of the Constitution, but 
in fact, states had long treated it as a crime. I would say that's his core argument. He does spend a large amount of time explaining how he got to the decision of overturning precedent. We'll get to that later the, in the conversation on stare decisis. But I think his core point is that this was not a constitutional right, has never been a constitutional right, and he looks to history to show that. In this conversation, I'll also point to some areas that I think are interesting, arguments that jumped out. Alito also points to the fact that Mississippi claims that many states, uh, many nations around the world restrict abortion and in fact uses this as justification for why uh, an abortion right may not be perceived as a universal right by every country and perhaps um, in his view, uh, would not have been at the time of the founding. In order to find whether or not there is a constitutional right to abortion, Alito lays out three steps. First, does the 14th Amendment notion of liberty include a right to abortion? Is the abortion right rooted in American history? And again, one and two are going to be intertwined, going to be connected for Alito. And three, is abortion supported by other constitutional precedent, common law precedent? The answer on all those will come back negative for Alito, but I'll walk through the arguments quickly. So the first prong, is there a right to an abortion in the Constitution? He looks at whether it was incorporated into the due process the due process rights were incorporated through the Ninth Amendment. He looks, for example, at arguments that it's found in the Ninth Amendment right of the people, um, that the rights that are not enumerated are retained by the people and is not persuaded. He goes on to talk about, again, history here, that unlike many of the rights enumerated in the, the first few amendments to the Constitution, Alito points to the fact that abortion rights were not recognized by states at the time of the founding. In fact, many of the states, if not all of the states, viewed some form of, abor of abortion as criminal. Again, into history arguments, um, he talks about this concept of the quickening. If you watched our interview with Alexia Korberg, they mentioned how this notion of the quickening uh, this was an early medical theory that at a certain period, I believe 16 to 18 weeks in, the baby would formally attach itself in some way that was referred to as the quickening. Alito spends a good bit of time both attacking it as, well, pseudoscience that was, he points out that it is no longer the medical view. And then he spends a decent amount of time analyzing how courts treated the quickening even back in England, for example. And he describes how, well, even though abortion was outright banned after the quickening, it was not presented as a right prior. And you know, he goes so far as to point to felony murder law to talk about how when a mother was killed, the murderer was held responsible for the death of the baby, regardless of whether or not the quote-unquote quickening had happened. Alito then goes on to dismantle the privacy argument that abortion is a right of women in their, their bodies under privacy. This constitutional doctrine comes out of cases like um, the contraception cases, or Loving Be Virginia, the right to marry someone outside of your race. Alito isn't particularly persuaded, as you can imagine, knowing the outcome certainly, um, but as you can imagine, is not particularly persuaded by this line of argument. And he goes on to say that if you follow that too far, you'll, you'll find that privacy permits a lot more than marrying someone outside of your race or using contraception with your partner. It, it might per permit prostitution. It might permit uh, you to use whatever drugs you want. 
which would be in violation of federal drug law. So he's drawing lines where privacy does not permit action as an indication that abortion might have taken things too far. He also goes on to say that unlike Loving v. Virginia, there are real concerns, critical moral questions, as he describes it, involved in the abortion decision uh, that are not present in the anti-misogenation, uh, the rules against marrying someone of the other uh, of another race. Now that said, those those who who would argue against Alito's position here would point out that at the time, those who who championed these, I think, universally viewed as disgusting backwards laws at the time, they were arguing that the morality was on their side as well. So there, you know, there may be some some pushback from opponents. And again, everything that I'm saying, this is just sharing the majority opinion. We don't have uh, since this was leaked, we don't have the dissents, which I guarantee you there will be. And we're not even sure that this will be the final draft. However, these are the opinions as this is the opinion as it's currently written. Uh, and there will be, of course, arguments on the other side. Alito, interestingly, does acknowledge the public policy arguments in favor of abortion and says, while there may be a number of strong public policy arguments on both sides, of course, you may not be surprised to hear that he argues that there may be public policy arguments in favor of banning abortion. He chooses not to weigh in and says, look, even if, even if there are strong public policy arguments, if we do not find authority to establish this right, well, those policy arguments are beside the point. Uh, we can't weigh in if we're not permitted to do so. And then finally, he touches on the 14th Amendment equal protection. This is an argument, again, this was not the prevailing argument in Casey and Roe, but this is an argument that's been made that abortion is protected under the 14th Amendment as a right that women should not be discriminated against. Sometimes this is brought up in an argument about the way that a pregnancy can change a woman's life, the way that the responsibilities of pregnancy fall on a woman. Uh, Alito doesn't have a lot of words dedicated to this particular argument, but dismisses it pointing to programs in place to, to permit adoption with no questions asked and similar policies that would, in his view, reduce some of the burden that would be placed on women. So I think with that, we have the main thrust of his argument against abortion. In sum, he, his argument against the abortion right is that the constitutional underpinnings aren't there. The history, and again, I can't stress this enough, Alito goes into great detail discussing the history of abortion, really making the argument that because abortion was a crime for such a long period of American history, even if it was only after the quickening, that in his view, it can't be treated as a right, as a fundamental right that was protected, protected by the Constitution. Again, that is Alito's argument and the argument of the majority in this unpublished draft. So in many respects, Alito's opinion is divided into two sections. One, is there an abortion right? And he finds the Constitution does not present one, does not authorize one. Section two is, hey, we already decided this. We found a constitutional right. Why are we able to change our mind? This is the conversation about stare decisis. And so why don't we turn to that? Stare decisis just means to let the previous decision stand, to let uh, precedent be a guide in, in, the, in the legal system. And it's a founding principle of 
the way the legal system works. That said, do courts change their opinion? Yes, and that's what we're going to get into here. So he starts with some basic quotes to perhaps get us warmed up for the fact that he's going to justify changing an opinion. He talks about how stare decisis is weakest when evaluating the Constitution and quotes a case called Augustini. He also quotes a famous case, Pearson v. Callahan, which describes stare decisis as not an inexorable command. In other words, okay, it's we should try and follow, but you don't have to always. Then Alito looks in justifying a change of opinion, in justifying the Supreme Court reversing itself. Alito goes where I think any court would reasonably go if they're looking for justification. And and that's to look at some of the worst examples of getting it wrong. And he, he quickly goes to, I think, a really strong example just to prove the point that stare decisis isn't set in stone. And there he looks at Plessy v. Ferguson, probably one of the most loathed cases in the Supreme Court record. This was the case that found that separate but equal, hey, that's actually okay. Um, And it took Brown v. Board of Education to overturn that. And then Alito shows his legal research abilities and perhaps the diligence of his clerks by including what looks like every example of uh, Supreme Court overturning prior decisions by the Supreme Court in history. And so for those who are legal scholars out there, it may be worth checking out. He even includes Obergefell, which was the gay marriage, the right to gay marriage case, a case where he incidentally was in the dissent, uh, but he includes that as an example of where the Supreme Court has changed its mind. Uh, In fact, the first on this very long list. And then after this extensive list uh, where Justice Alito and his clerks have cataloged uh, any cases where the Supreme Court has reversed itself, he goes on to point to a test for when stare decisis can be overturned. When can precedent when can the Supreme Court change its mind? And this is a case actually was uh, the, was written by Justice Kavanaugh. And the, the five prongs of the test is, one, the nature of the error, two, the quality of the reasoning, three, basically how workable was the regime that was in place prior, four, what was... Was it interfering with other areas of law? And five is a reliance question. Has the country basically come to rely on this particular case? And will it cause problems to change your mind? So I'll go through quickly because I, you know, I want to keep this, I want to keep this relatively brief. But first off, the nature of the error, as no doubt. You, you remember from prior in this conversation, since it was a constitutional error in Alito's view, it is the type, the most important type of error to be corrected. And he, you know, he cites to Byron White and again mentions the, the Plessy decision in, in justifying why this type of error uh, are, is the type of error to be, to be uh, set straight. He spends a bit more time in prong two where he analyzes the quality of the reasoning. And here, Alito is is really scathing, is not holding his punches when he describes Roe as an error from the start, where he describes uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey as basically untenable um, and poorly reasoned. If you want to dig a bit deeper, I think this is starting from around page 41 in the opinion, and he goes quite a bit deeper into the history again, again, mentioning how, well, there's no historical uh, respect for a right to abortion because abortion had been criminalized for so many years in so many jurisdictions. 
here Alito goes on an extensive takedown uh, and rips into the viability argument as poorly reasoned. And, you know, I, I won't go into all the details, but one of the areas where he presents a cogent attack relates to the fact that viability may be a moving target, particularly if, you know, the science shifts or that viability may be different at one hospital or one institution versus another and uses this as a justification to uh, to question the reasoning behind Roe. He also relies on the fact that the reasoning between the two cases, and, and here I'm talking about Roe and Casey, the reasoning between the two cases diverges, and he uses that as a justification uh, as further evidence that there is no unified theory on uh, an abortion right. In fact, uh, because of the the differences in the arguments in Roe and Casey, um, that the precedent is actually uh, weaker because of it. Under the question of whether it's workable here, I think Alito's main argument is that a lot of the test under Casey involves creating an undue burden on a, mother, on a mother seeking an abortion, and Alito just finds it vague. Um, and he, he has a few examples that he brings forth, but essentially his main argument as to workability is that it's difficult to determine what an undue burden is. It's difficult to determine whether uh, a procedure or, or whether some obstacle is is viewed is viewed as necessary and it's uh difficult to to tell whether an obstacle is a substantial one so here he's he's essentially pointing to a lot of the laws that over the last 30 years have attempted to restrict abortion and even the law that casey was examining and he points to a couple of circuit splits uh when it comes to certain abortion restrictions such as parental notification requirements. But again, I think the workability argument is is not where he spends most of his his verbal capital and neither is where he d is is the next section where he talks about the disruptive effects on the law. This was one of the one of the prongs of this five prong test and the one that he probably spends the least time on and possibly the most in the weeds of the five. This is whether abortion law is interfering with other areas of law. Here he he makes a reference to a couple of things for the real wonks out there. He talks about how it, it may be impacting race judicata principles and third party standing doctrine. But again, he does so rather rather briefly and or perhaps it's an inside baseball reference to those who are very familiar i won't go into it in detail partly because i haven't had a chance to get smart on those and partly because i think it's not central to his main arguments finally alito has to talk about the fifth prong which is reliance our american women in particular, also men, but are American women reliant on the abortion right? Is this going to change the way we live? Have we come to rely on the ability to get an abortion? And here, surprisingly, I think put, uh, Alito punts in many ways and says that decision is is too difficult to tell. But he, he leans into that and says, look, not only is this a political decision, but we as Supreme Court justices cannot be swayed by what is popular and then goes on to quote former Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who said, in fact, even if we wanted to uh, do what was popular, sometimes we can't because we're not authorized. Again, going back to his previous argument that if abortion is not a constitutional right, which he's already determined, then in this case, Supreme Court may not be justified is not justified to uh, to require that it be protected
Alito also goes on in the, under the reliance argument to say, look, if the country was really relying on abortion rights, then this debate would have been put to bed. However, it hasn't. He's, he mentions that multiple states have, in fact, requested that Roe be overturned, that states have passed repeated laws that attempted to, if not overturn Roe, flew in the face of Roe, or at least reduced the protections of Roe. And he finds that this uh, gives some additional protection for his reliance argument. In sum, he points out that there are five prongs to the test, and that in this case, uh, no surprise here, the all indicators point to overturning, overturning Roe, overturning Casey. So what does that mean for this particular case? And again, here we're talking about a particular case, the Dobbs case in Mississippi, the Gestational Age Act in Mississippi. And once Roe and Casey are overturned, well, he points out that the Supreme Court's left with just a rational basis test. And for those who, again, remember their constitutional law, the rational basis test is pretty shockingly easy to meet. Um, generally, if a court is looking at something using the rational basis test, you'll expect an outcome in favor of the state. And no surprise here, uh, Alito finishes off by saying, as a result, Mississippi does have a rational basis, that being to protect the life of the child. And in conclusion, we're overturning Roe, we're overturning Casey, Mississippi's law stands. So what does this mean on the ground? How does this impact women's access to abortion or to terminating pregnancy? Well, it's somewhat to be determined, but we do know that approximately 13 states currently have so-called trigger bans, which means if this case were published today, those laws would go into effect immediately, restricting access to abortion. And, you know, according to scholars, we would expect a total of over 20 states to follow suit. So again, state by state, it's unlikely that New York or California would see any restrictions on abortion, but dozens of states, uh, large swaths of states would see abortion fully banned, if not severely restricted. So that's the Dobbs decision in a nutshell right now. Again, we can't promise that it won't change. This is an unpublished opinion. Finally, again, a reminder that this case is not published. This is an unpublished leaked draft Drafted as the majority opinion in the Dobbs v. Jackson case, it is so far unpublished and may be subject to change. But given that it, in its current form, overturns Roe, fully overturns Roe and Casey, we thought it was ripe for conversation. So again, thanks for the time and for watching Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Good night. Good night.